Hi everybody, it is 545 and I am thrilled to say that I am here. Um, I'm in New York City and I'm here with Dr. Adam Kaplan. Um, Dr. Adam Kaplan is a neuropsychiatrist at Johns Hopkins University. Um, he is a specialist in MS and depression and uh, I'm going to call him Adam because we've spent some time together, but Adam and I actually met on a webcast on the Huffington Post kind of like this, so it feels really circular to be um, having him kind of be one of our first interviews here. I'm super excited to, um, to have this dialogue, and I'm kind of going to start with Adam um, and just ask him um, to kind of start this discussion with how he defines depression. So, Dr. Kaplan. Hey, Kate. I thought it was Adam. Then you went to Dr. Kaplan. I, know, I was trying to be a <laughs> Bad me. No so worries. So let's, let's talk. Let's generally start with the whole idea of what depression is, especially in MS. Great. Um, first of all, thank you so much for um, allowing me to come here and you know spread the word and thank thanks to all the listeners that make it possible for us to actually have a reason to do this um, because really. Uh, depression is one of the most important aspects of MS, and it's one of the silent symptoms, meaning it's one of the symptoms of MS that gets short shrift. It isn't recognized. People don't get how important it is. And uh, through the discussion today, if nothing else, we'll hopefully try to convey to people that this is not your fault. This is a product of the MS, but missing it has really important implications and that it's treatable. So um, starting off with the question, what is depression? Is that it? Yeah, so what is depression? Okay, so <clears throat> depression is basically not, so first let's talk what it's not. Depression is not just demoralization. We all get to a certain point where we get overwhelmed and our coping strategies get overwhelmed and we say, you know, I just feel, you know, hopeless, but sort of uh, in a way that I feel overmastered by the situation. I feel alone. I feel like nobody understands it. Um, but basically, um, it's more just the coping with getting up and doing the things I need to do in a daily way and juggling all of the balls that are in the air. The other thing it's not is sadness. So sadness is sort of depression with a small d. Sadness is to depression what um, cough is to pneumonia. So lots of people have coughs and it's not the result of pneumonia. Lots of people have sadness and it's not the cause of you know depression. Sometimes people have a cough. Um, or pneumonia even without a cough, and some people have depression without sadness, and particularly in the young and the very old, it's irritability. Um, so really, you have to consider the company the cough keeps. If it's a cough with a temperature and sort of a fuzzy thing on the chest x-ray, we call that pneumonia. What we call clinical depression is when people have five of nine symptoms are greater than two weeks. And those symptoms are sleep problems. It's either early morning awakenings. Um, lots of us, when we're anxious, sort of counting all of the things we have to do the next day, we'll have a hard time falling asleep. But early morning awakenings is one of the characteristics. Or sleeping all the time, not being able to get out of bed, sort of watching the, you know, the, the clock tick away one minute after the next. Um, decreased interest or pleasure. People's get up and go has gotten up and gone. Um, feelings of guilt or worthlessness. People just think uh, that they are a burden, that you know, other people shouldn't worry. This gets in the way of people getting help. Um, low energy, low mood. And again, there's that mood, but mood is just one of nine symptoms, and so you don't even require it. Um, concentration problems, and this can be so bad in depression that particularly in the elderly, it can look like Alzheimer's disease. So we see people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in nursing homes, and it's really a depression. We treat the depression. They, their cognition gets better again. They go home and live independently. Appetite changes for, uh, it's either comfort grazing, and for women it tends to be chocolate, men it tends to be salty foods, but obviously it wow. switches around. Really? Yeah, yeah. And uh, there's even some evidence that chocolate has some antidepressant properties, dark chocolate that is. Um, and, uh, or it can be, you know, a uh, lack of appetite, food doesn't taste the same anymore. These are physiological changes, and people have tremendous weight loss. Sometimes they get diagnosed with, gee, maybe this is cancer, we need to look into this, but, um, but it's usually the depression in that case. What um, then are called psychomotor uh, retardation, which is people aren't their normal bubbly selves, or thoughts of death, or not wanting to go on. You need to have five of those nine symptoms, at least one of which must be decreased interest or decreased mood. And then you bought yourself the diagnosis of a clinical depression. The more symptoms you have, the more likely you are to respond to treatment. So that is the way we define clinical depression in medicine.
You know, it's funny because I'm, I'm looking at this app and how to use, and one of the things that's really cool is when you're listing those depressions um, with those uh, symptoms of depression, uh, people can respond in terms of hearts. And there was a very large stream of hearts that came out of the screen um, talking about the concentration problems. Yeah, and what I tell people is, and I get said people um, with MS uh, who have questions about their concentration, and is it due to the MS? Is it due, uh, so, you know, it's usually either MS, medicines, um, or mood. Those are the top three causes of problems. And what I tell people is, I can't promise you if you're depressed that the depression's causing 10% of your cognitive impairment or 90% of your cognitive impairment as opposed to the MS causing the rest. But what I promise you is treating the depression is a whole lot more effective than trying to treat the cognitive impairment of MS. Unfortunately, we just don't have very good treatments currently to treat the actual cognitive impairments. We have coping strategies so that if it's due to the depression, you want to treat the depression. And what I tell people is once your mood's all the way back to your old self in terms of your depression, you're feeling like your old self in those five of nine symptoms, or nine of nine symptoms, depending on how many you have, then whatever you're left with, that will work on and see, you know, if that's due to the MS. So I think when you had heard about the whole idea, I mean, I can say living with MS, that I remember having this huge weight of depression, wondering, oh gosh, what's my life going to be like? But one of the most interesting insights that I found hearing about depression is the idea that MS actually... Um, as a result of the MS, depression happens. Because I think there's a real control issue for certain people that feel like they can't, they don't have the ability to get out of it. And I just think there's, it's worth you kind of stating about, um, about the nature of the depression. Yeah, and I think that that's really critical. So if there's no other point that people take away from tonight, it's, uh, or this evening here, hopefully it is that the depression isn't personal weakness, it's not a character flaw, it's not G, um, you know, um, you'd be depressed too if you had MS because the truth of it is that it doesn't correlate with disability, which it would if it's just G, you're being overwhelmed. So meaning people in wheelchairs are no more likely to have a clinical depression than people who are upright and walking around. In fact, I have some patients who are clinically depressed who say, I know it sounds horrible, but I kind of wish I dragged a leg or had something that people could see because the depression is causing so much pain and no one gets it. So it, there's that aspect to it. But what we really know is that these cytokines, these chemical messengers that the immune cells use, one to connect with the other, one to communicate with the next. There are neurotransmitters that help our neurons communicate. There are cytokines that help our immune cells communicate. And these cause cause depression. We know that with hepatitis uh, C, for instance, one of the treatments is to give just one of, you know, uh, tens of cytokines, and that one cytokine alone that goes up at MS causes depression. So we know that MS causes the depression based on the inflammation going on in the brain. So what happens um, to the MS as a result of the depression? So <clears throat> that is a critical issue as well, which is to say that not only does MS cause the depression, the depression worsens the MS. And that's really critical to understand is that treating the depression is one of the treatments you can do, not, because, not just because depression is a horrible, potentially lethal outcome of the MS, but because treating it will actually improve. It's one of the ways you can improve your MS, which is critical. And in fact, we now have data from just the past year that shows not only does MS, sorry, does depression worsen MS, depression turns out to be a risk factor for getting MS. So just being depressed is enough that over the next 10 years, it doubles your risk of getting MS. Um, just like vitamin D increases, low vitamin D increases your risk. So it has a really profound impact. And I think that what people often don't understand is that the number one correlate of quality of life for people with MS is not whether they're fatigued or whether they have pain even. It is whether they have a clinical depression. It's the number one correlate of quality of life. But even if not for yourself, for your loved ones, it's also the number one correlate of quality of life of the caregivers, of the family members, because being with someone who's depressed is really difficult. So and, let me, let me please. Uh, stop you there, because I know that one counterpain who is a caregiver who asked about the whole idea of, like, help me. I'm a caregiver that I know that my loved one is depressed. What can I do to help? The first thing um, 
that you can do, there, there are two really important things. The first thing to realize is that it is not that your loved one who's depressed is picking on you, but what happens is pretending you're not depressed during the day, um, which is what people with depression do, because when people say, hey, how you doing, Adam? They don't want me to say, oh, I'm really depressed. You have an hour and we can sit and talk about yeah. it. They want me to suck, Phil. <laughs> so what they want is you to just say, great, how you doing, Bob? So people fake it. People fake uh, that they're not depressed. But let me tell you, it's exhausting to pretend that you're listening to someone and not thinking, why are they talking to me? I'm a miserable person. They don't really care about me. I'm not going to have anything interesting to say. So that when people who are depressed and going through the day or go to a party and come home, then they're their normally depressed selves and they're just being honest with the caregiver. But I hear from the caregivers all the time, he looked great at the party, then he comes home and he sits like a bump on the log. So the first thing they realize is that they're not picking on you, they're just being their normal depressed self. That's how they really are. That's number one. Number two is you have to remember. As the patient, the person who's living with MS? The caregiver, the caregiver is okay. not being picked on. It's just that that person with depression is faking it during the day when they get home. Then they're, you know, letting it all hang out. They're just honestly, it's a compliment that they're saying, I can be my real depressed self with you. Then the second, and this is more important than the first, is to realize that it is very difficult to take care of someone with MS. It's even more difficult to take care of someone with MS and depression. And what you have to understand is you need to recharge your engines. So all the time I hear caregivers say they don't go out anymore, they don't hang out with their friends, they don't go to shows because it's you know hard to get there and people are fatigued with MS. So let me tell you, you have to get out of the house and go take care of yourself socially as well as medically and physically in order to recharge your engines. It's like the oxygen mask drop down in the airplane. Who are you going to put it on first, yourself or your children or your loved ones? Who would you put it on first, Kate? Right, I would put it on myself or e I'm supposed to. Exactly. Although we, we are feeling guilty, especially if someone is debilitated, they can't go out whatever it is, um, dealing with that factor of thinking, oh, my life goes on and my loved one doesn't, and how hard that is. It's really hard, and again, those of you who have MS, please push your loved ones out at least once a week and just say, please, go. Go do something. Do something so that when you come back, you won't be irritable, you'll be recharged, your engines will be good, and then you'll be able to better take care of all of the things that we need to take care of because the MS affects the whole family. Um, so, that um, may uh, be feeling kind of some of these symptoms that you talk about, what are some suggestions, you know, like what you just said for caregivers, of uh, the, you know, go out once a week, recharge your batteries, et cetera. What would you tell for patients um, who are having a low day um, in terms of kind of some short term things that they could do? So I just want to make sure I understand. You mean a low day because they have a clinical depression going on or a low day because we all have a bad day every now and then? Well, I think some of the people um, may not know where they stand in it, right? So we can start with, the, I guess, actually having a clinical depression. Okay. So if you're having a clinical depression, one of the most important things to realize is that you're not the expert, okay? So what that means is just like you're not going to say, oh, yeah, I've got MS. I'll treat it myself, and I don't need to go find out about all of these treatments for MS, you know, um, the ABCR, uh, you know, Tecfidera, Jelenia, Tysabri. I, won't, I don't need to find out about all that stuff because I know I'm doctor, you know, uh, my own doctor. You don't say that about MS, and you shouldn't say that about depression, meaning you should make sure you're getting evaluated, that it's the right diagnosis, and you're getting the right treatment. Now, among the right treatment, along those lines, um, we know that medication and talk therapy work better than either one alone. We know that for severe depression, you can talk till the cows come home and it won't fix it unless you add the medications, the medications, uh, and hopefully we'll talk about the medications implications for MS uh, in a bit. But the other thing that's important to know is that exercise is a great antidepressant. In fact, what it is really good at, exercise is really good at once your mood gets better. Exercise by itself won't usually make people who are depressed not depressed, but it's really good at keeping people once they've gotten better from their depression. It's really good at keeping them in remission. So a lot of times people who are really, you know, running marathons and this kind of stuff, 
If you want to know the truth, what they're running from is depression that runs in the family or depression that they've had before, and that exercise is critical. So if you notice that with the depression, you've stopped, you know, you've gotten onto the couch, you've stopped exercising, and again, as best you can, as the depression starts to improve, certainly you need to get back to exercising, get back to the kinds of things the social Kick it into the saddle. Yeah, the social connectedness. Um, if you stop going to church, start going to church again. If you stop going to social settings, go to social settings as you start to feel better. Sleep is really important and, you know, regular diet. This is good for any crisis management. You got to sleep, you got to eat regularly. Now, the other thing is, since you're not a doctor, <clears throat> please do not try to self-medicate because one of the common things that people do is, guess what, alcohol. Alcohol seems like it's a good antidepressant, but it's the opposite. If it's you, bubbly. It is bubbly. Alcohol as a way of self-medicating is so cruel because yes, it's an anesthetic, emotional anesthetic, so when you drink it, you feel better, but it is, if you take a pharmacology book off the shelf, alcohol is listed as a CNS depressant. And what that means is that even 25% of people who don't have a depression will get a depression from drinking alcohol. It worsens mood over time. So you have to be really careful about self-medicating with alcohol because you're actually having temporary relief and long-term worsening. Wow. Um, so treating um, patients with depression, do you find that people that come to you um, have really big, big slides, or do you feel like it's an up and down thing? Because I do feel in the world of MS, um, especially with with my counter pain and watching the way that people moodify, there's a lot of like up down, up down, up down. And I'm curious for you on um, on what you find uh, in in terms of your patients and what that's like for you too. What about you? Well, thank you, Kate, and I care about you. Thank you. Woo, okay. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> Mrs. Milliken. So, um, what, so again, it's not one size fits all, but what I will tell you is that often with MS, the kinds of depressions people get in, they describe sort of a slow slide into this low mood that then is fixed and low. And one of the things I hear from patients all the time is, but you don't understand, Dr. Kaplan, there's no reason for me to be depressed. I've got a wonderful family and my wife cares about me and I've got a decent job, so why am I feeling so depressed? And I will let them know that is one of the best indications that this is a clinical depression. If you were depressed after your spouse decided they hated you and they didn't want to have anything to do with you, that would be a normal reaction, uh, a low mood to that kind of thing. But if you're depressed and there's no reason, guess what? The reason is because there's a chemical change in your brain. So that's really important as an indication um, to be aware of. I, I'd like to also say one more thing, but maybe you can tell people who are watching. Um, the whole idea of, of a self-consciousness about feeling low and the importance from your perspective of actually telling your doctor you feel that way. <clears throat> right, so things if I can, you know, uh, also, I, I think I didn't do justice to the very complicated question you asked. You know, with the moodifier, people whose moods go up and down, again, a clinical depression, Often it sort of goes down. There's a, there are two types of depression. Uh, actually, there's multiple types of depression. One type of depression is what's called recurrent depression, where people will sort of sometimes go up and down into these depressions that wax and wane. Then there's what's called bipolar disorder, where sometimes, like a bicycle has two wheels, the mood can either go up or down. Um, and those people get really activated and they don't sleep, they don't need much sleep and they get into this sort of hyper m mode where they're talking a mile a minute and they feel like socializing all the time but sometimes it can have this irritable what's called a mixed state and that's very dangerous because their moods are down but their energy's up and that's really a bad place to be. But sometimes people's, you know, some people's temperament, their, their emotional reactivity, some people, you know, are just, um, you know, like what do they say that, how do you tell a, um, an introverted engineer from an extroverted engineer, an introverted engineer stares at his shoes when he talks to you, an extroverted engineer stares at your shoes while he talks to you. Some people are just very, very flat in their mood. Other people, their moods go up and down, you know, they're just, you know, I look at these people who are, you know, on, uh, these television shows like, oh, if I don't get on to this show, I'm going to just, you know, my life's over. And they have huge emotional reactivity to whatever happens during the day. So sometimes that's just how people are wired. So I want you to be who's watching um, or who will watch this who literally can't get out of bed. So what is your response to them um, if they're watching this? 
to them is, look, you're not crazy. You've got a normal reaction to one of the most common symptoms, uh, one of the most common syndromes associated with MS. So 50% plus of people with MS will get this clinical depression at some point, 25% at any given time. And what I would say is, you're not crazy. You've got a known consequence of this disease for many people. What crazy is, is doing the same thing day after day and expecting a different result. So if you go out to the car one morning and you start it up and it doesn't start, and you go back in the house and you say, eh, maybe tomorrow it'll start. You go back out tomorrow and it doesn't start and you don't call somebody by like the next day or maybe the first week. But if you've been in bed and things haven't been going right for weeks, guess what? You're, it's, you're, it's like you're going out to the car expecting something different to happen every day and it's not. You need to do something different. You need to get evaluated and see if this is a depression that can be treated. Uh, you, um, and you may not speak in uber scientific terms. <laughs> um, you know about the research happening with depression. I know um, from my work with the MS Society that it's really become something that people are paying more attention to. So what can people who are dealing with depression and MS look forward to in terms of what's coming down the pike? Yeah, so <clears throat> the first thing is, again, MS causes the depression through the inflammation happening in the brain. It's important that you know that it's a potentially lethal consequence. Remember, we talked to one of the nine symptoms is thoughts of death or suicide. Up to 30% of people with MS will have thoughts of calling it quits. So again, you're not crazy if you have those thoughts, but remember, that's the wrong solution because that's the longest term solution to a short term problem. The depression is treatable. So the other thing that is sort of now beginning to be fully appreciated or certainly more appreciated is that it turns out these medications that we've been using to treat depression, um, it turns out that they have neuroprotective properties, many of them. So again, why do I study uh, MS and depression? Because MS has the highest rate of depression of any medical or neurological illness. And so that's a good model to understand depression. So it shouldn't come as a complete shock that just because um, MS causes depression, other forms of inflammation cause depression too, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes or what have you. And it turns out these medicines that we've been using, like the SSRIs, turn out to have neuroprotective properties. So if you take people who are not depressed with MS and you put them on Prozac in the study that was done, those patients are um, two times less likely to have new enhancing lesions on their 24 weeks of study. Wow. And people who have had a stroke and get put on Prozac, um, why Prozac? Because it's the oldest SSRI, most of the research has been done on it, therefore. People following a stroke have a much better chance of having a meaningful and significant recovery of function if they're on um, an SSRI, and now what's really exciting is that we're beginning to see not just SSRIs, but lithium and a number of these other antidepressant property, uh, antidepressant medicines um, seem to not only be neuroprotective, but are working together in a way that may, and we're now doing this research as we speak, it's being done, to see if these medicines can actually slow the progression of MS. We're really good at bringing the inflammation down, we're really bad at slowing the progression, and they may be, and those studies are ongoing may be an effective way to really you know, help MS, not just through their help on the depression, but their independent help on the MS. Wow, that's awesome. It's like a... um, okay, I think that's it for now. Um, I want to thank Dr. Adam Kaplan for being part of our first broadcast. I'm really proud to tell you, Adam, that you got a lot of hearts. Um, I'm hearing from all of you guys who are part of this. Please reach out um, to at my counterpane. Um, or send me a message and let me know what you think.